one of the major things is the soft tissue discovery in dinosaurs. Why is that so significant? The significance of what I call original biomaterials, because I think that covers what we're talking about. Uh, some of the tissue isn't tissue, it's just biochemicals. Some of, some of it's not soft, it's actually kind of crunchy. Um, but it shouldn't, none of it should be there if it's as old as the establishment asserts. Because we know that this material, whether it's proteins or, um, um, or other biochemicals like maybe DNA, these proteins should not be there uh, after even one million years. So that's the significance, is why do we keep finding proteins and other biochemicals in fossils if they're really that old? So that's the big dilemma. Uh, one way to answer that is to suggest that maybe they're not that old. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we say, oh, they're, they're not as old as we all believe, then wow, that's a real uh, paradigm shift. And that's a real uh, difficult place to go mentally. So, it, so it's very significant because um, not only is it difficult for, uh, uh, for someone who strongly believes in millions of years, history to uh, it's difficult for them to to um, to even ask the question could this could this challenge could the could these uh, uh, biomolecules challenge my belief on this but uh, it's also significant because look if you do challenge your belief if you do the hard work if you do the brave thing and that is to say maybe this stuff is not that old then guess what a different history comes into play now we're talking about a history that's more in line with the Bible's version of history, that means that the Bible might be right, and that means that the God of the Bible might be right about what he said. So that means if God's right about history, then that means he's right about what he says about my heart. So there's a spiritual connection, and it's a very significant and potentially eternally significant uh, uh, impact of this, of this research. Old Earth creationist organizations are, many of them are not talking about it, from what I can tell. And Reasons to Believe seems to be making it a non-story, saying it could easily happen. Uh, why do you think there's an agenda behind this? So talk about the old Earth creation. They're set in their belief. And there's no amount of evidence, with, no matter how reasonable or how scientific or how well done, that evidence comes forward. It's just not having any, any change and any effect. Um, why is that? Well, now you're talking about the human condition, you know. So the old earth creation organizations have made assertions that are not based on science. And the assertions are, oh, we just, we, we see no problem with this. And then they just go right on as, the, as if there's no problem. Wait a minute, put on the brakes. You can't just brush it aside and pretend like there's no problem. There's an elephant in the room, and it's still in the room. Whether or not, you know, you can walk around the elephant, you know, with blinders on, but uh, we, all we want to do is pull the blinders down, you know, and look. Oh, there's an elephant here, and it is original biomaterials still in fossils. And here's the thing: they say, "Well, we don't have a problem with. We, we expect this to happen. We expect these materials to still be here." Based on what? Because the science of tissue decay, the science of protein decay, demonstrates, not just illustrates, I'm talking proves in a lab, a repeatable experimental proof type of uh, uh, background, that this stuff should not last even one million years. That's the elephant in the room. So to ignore the elephant in the room is one way that the human psychology deals with it, deals with it. But um, we, we just want to point out that it's a bad way to deal with it. It, 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 uh, it ignores the, the, the facts of science. So one of the things that kind of gets me is that when I have conversations with people about this project, the vast majority of them have never heard of it. And yet, if you were to go uh, back to 2005, it was a worldwide story. It was in 60 Minutes, it was in Newsweek, in Time, and, and probably uh, newspapers around the world, and yet very few people seem to really know about it. I suspect that 
the media is kind of taking clues from the scientific community, which is basically saying it's a non-story because it's just a preservation issue or because it's, you know, I think initially they thought that it was the biofilm, uh, that it wasn't really soft tissue, uh, these kinds of things. Would you respond to some of that as far as the media and why this isn't a story, why this isn't as, as revolutionary as it, as it really should be? You know, because potentially it'd be like putting, uh, you know, evolution is on this teetering. It, it could be falling off a cliff. One way to answer that is I don't think a lot of people are just getting told. It just, it's, we're just not telling the story from one person to the, to the next. Um, for example, I went to the, uh, uh, Natural History Museum in Houston, and uh, one of the um, students was working there. She's like a living exhibit, she, working on a dinosaur bone there in the museum. And I said, hey, what you doing? And she said, I'm working on this dinosaur bone. And, and I said, um, hey, have you heard about these original tissues and, and, and biochemicals like proteins that are still in dinosaur bones? Have you heard about that? And she said, well, yeah. Because she's the expert, she has to say that she knows it, you know, because she's a student. Students know everything. And, uh, and I said, well, what do you think about that? I mean, how do you explain that you still have these proteins in dino bones? How do you explain that? And she said, um, they're not actual proteins because it's a fossil. And that was her answer. And I thought, here you are, a paleontology graduate student, and your professors aren't even teaching you the basics of the most fundamental uh, uh, discoveries in the whole world of paleontology. She has no clue about them. So if the paleontologists that are getting trained, uh, the next generation of paleontologists, aren't getting taught that there are plenty of proteins in fossils, then people just don't know. They're just not talking about it. When it comes to the specimens that have been found. Mary Schweitzer found the, in the femur of the, of the T-Rex, and then uh, Hadasaur uh, was found later to find soft tissues, and now the Triceratops horn. Are there other specimens that you're aware of where there's dinosaur soft tissue? So they're all over. I mean, we've had, it's not just T-Rex, it's not just one T-Rex, and it's not just a T-Rex and a Hadrosaur femur, uh, we have Triceratops horn, so that's three dinosaurs, but long before then, there was a uh, Tarbosaurus that uh, in 19, the 1970s, researchers were working on that, and they demonstrated proteins in this, it, from the 70s. Uh, not just that, there's just, there's just all kinds. Um, throughout the 80s, they even had uh, some discoveries, and these are all published in the technical literature. Eggshell, dinosaur eggshell proteins. Um, proteins inside of a dinosaur uh, sauropod embryo. Proteins in there. Uh, proteins in a um, seismosaur from uh, uh, New Mexico. Uh, uh, the list goes on. It's a long list. It's like 40 I've compiled 40 and I stopped because I got tired of compiling <laughs> original biomaterials in all these fossils. And it's been being published for decades. Uh, it's real. But if you go to a museum, like I went to the, the Carnegie Museum a couple of years ago, and there's a placard in the museum and it says something like, um, uh, fossils are the, um, uh, are the remains of living things that have been turned into rock. And there's no such thing as original uh, biomaterials, something like that. And I just thought, okay, the museums are telling a story. The professors are telling their grad students stories that just don't match the published facts in the literature. Why not? Let's tell it like it is. It's soft, it's squishy, it's proteins, and it's in dinosaur bones, and it's in all kinds of other fossils uh, throughout the entire geologic column. So we even have fossils of sponges uh, with original biomaterial in the, uh, chitin is the name of the, of the biomaterial in sponges. That's in there. Uh, and it's supposed to be 500 million years old, and yet it's still biological? It has not turned into rock? Wow, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a trick. 
How do you pull that trick off? How do you make soft, squishy stuff last for 500 million years? That's a big magic wand right there. And it defies science, because the science shows that these biomaterials fall apart at a regular rate under the optimum preservation conditions. Best case scenario, it still falls apart. Why? Because the second law of thermodynamics, basic fundamental law, says all highly organized systems tend toward decay. They all do. And there's no exception to that rule. And chemicals are no exception to that rule. So biochemicals, even if bacteria don't attack them, even if water and hydrogen and oxygen and hydroxyls and whatever else is kept at bay, even under the best case conditions, it will spontaneously fall apart. That's how we know this stuff should not be there after even one million years, let alone 500 million, like some of these have been presented in the literature. Mary Schweitzer has criticized creationists for suggesting that the soft tissue supports uh, young earth, that uh, creationists kind of hijacked her, her data. How do you respond to that? Dr. Mary Schweitzer admitted that there's two interpretations of her result. She said, number one, it could be that the stuff is not as old as we think it is. Number two, it could be that we don't understand how this, these proteins are preserved. She, um, she says we need to look at option two. She's simply unwilling to, to give option one the time of day. Uh, and, and, um, but my question is why? Why are we unwilling to, to just even look at the possibility that these things might be young? That's not science. Science should examine all possibilities and weigh those possibilities against the available data. Science should not cut off a possibility before examining it, but you only cut it off after you have weighed it and discounted it based on the evidence. So it's a paradigm first position that she's taken, and that's her choice. Um, I think that though, uh, like many of our colleagues, they are absolutely convinced that radioisotope dating has proven that these rock layers are millions of years old, and therefore whatever fossils are in them are millions of years old. But they don't understand the, the assumptions and the um, flaws and the problems with the radioisotope results. They're not radioisotope chemists or, or nuclear physicists. They just trust that these other guys who did the radioisotope work gives the right results and they're believing that these other scientists are giving them the right information and they're working with that with that as an assumption. What we've done is we've examined the radioisotope results themselves, we've done the hard work and we've discovered, whoa, th these, uh, these isotope decay systems just don't work. They're broken clocks. We have specific reasons why, uh, but see, if you, if you pull that out, that whole radioisotope argument, uh, if you pull that out, then now you've got rocks that could be any age. And now you insert the observation that these rocks have fossils in them, which have proteins in them, which are young looking. Why not say maybe they actually are young? That's a valid scientific hypothesis, period. She has also commented that God asks for faith, not evidence. Do you think God intends his existence to be without evidence? Um, God reveals himself. Um, he has been revealing himself. He came to earth in the form of a human man, Jesus, who showed evidence after evidence after evidence that he was God. He healed the sick. He turned water into wine. He rose, he, he rose Lazarus from the dead. These are powerful evidences. He rose himself from the dead. Wow, that's, that's God saying, look at the evidence, look at the evidence. Look at the historical evidence in the, in the uh, case of the New Testament so that we can examine the claims of Christ to see if they match the, um, the facts. You know, uh, So God is all about doing whatever he can from whatever angle to, uh, to demonstrate his existence, not just his existence, but his loving kindness 
his characteristics, which are, like the Bible says, clearly seen from that which he has made. Um, so if God's not interested in showing himself by evidence, then why does he constantly do it <laughs> and do it so well? Because of the masterful design uh, throughout the cosmos that we see. How, did the, how do you get this place so well organized? How do I get this hand with, you know, with the fingers that can do this? This just doesn't happen. You know. uh, God is giving us evidence right in front of our faces that shows us that he did this, he's here, he's real, um, and, and he wants to know us. He wants to get to know us. He wants us to get to know him forever. That's cool. Thank you, God. <laughs>